Hello, and welcome to The Basics of Paint with John Deal. At a basic level, paint consists of some pigment suspended in a vehicle like water, and a binder like egg, gum arabic, or acrylic resin. The binder holds it together when it dries so it doesn't just flake off the surface. With oil paint, the oil acts as both the vehicle and the binder. As long as 40,000 years ago, perhaps even longer, Paint was as simple as using ground minerals like iron oxide, ochre, or hematite mixed into animal fat or the calcium-rich water found in caves. During the early Minoan era on the Mediterranean island of Crete, pigments were applied to fresh plaster using water to make frescoes. As the plaster dried, it would set, sealing the pigments in. This image of a toreador celebrates Minoan culture and exhibits their unique style. Asian lacquerware was developed in China and Japan, with examples dating back as early as 12,000 years ago. This medium used the sap from a local tree that could be thinned with alcohol or mixed with drying oils such as perilla oil or cedar oil, often used to adorn ornate boxes with its iconic red cinnabar or black designs. This example of a painted scene comes from the later Zhou Dynasty. Pigment mixed into beeswax was used by early Egyptians to make encaustic paint. Due to its viscosity when heated and hardness when cooled, its excellent adhesion and its preservative properties, it became a favored medium. Portraits of the dead, commonly referred to as mummy paintings, would adorn the sarcophagi of prominent revered figures or well-loved relatives. While also being an ancient technique, Let's try that again. While also being an ancient technique dating back to the early Egyptians, egg tempera eventually replaced encaustic painting during the Byzantine, medieval, and early Renaissance eras. A simple mixture of pigment, water, and egg was sometimes accompanied by liquid myrrh to create a multi-sensory experience for the viewer. The early Renaissance saw artists experiment with suspending pigments and oils. Most notable was Jan van Eyck, who was one of the early pioneers of the novel process. Raw pigment is ground into a fine powder and added to a drying oil, such as linseed, which acts as both vehicle and binder. Later artists would experiment with adding more oil for glazes, commonly referred to as a fat mixture. Others would thin it with turpentine for underpainting, referred to as a lean mixture. It is important to remember to always paint fat over lean, Otherwise, the leaner top layers will dry quicker than the fatter bottom layers, and the paint will crack. Artist's oil paint is, at its basic formulation, pigment suspended in a drying oil. This is most commonly linseed oil. Early formulations could have also used gum turpentine, distilled from a pine tree resin, to give it a glossy sheen. Modern oil paints like Windsor Newton, Old Holland, or Holbein use simply pigment and oil. Oil paint offers a long drying time, or, more accurately, the paint is hardened through a process called auto-oxidization. This permits a longer handling time, allowing the artist to blend colors better as well as to create luminous glazes. This also means that the oil painter needs to be patient to allow the part paint to dry before working back on into the piece. There are two types of oils drying oils, and wet oils. Drying oils go through an exothermic chemical process that allows the oil to catalyze over time and dry. The linseed, walnut, poppy seed, and safflower oil are examples of this type. These are all good oils to use when painting to thin the paint if required as they will dry over time. The most notable wet oil that is often used in painting is vegetable oil. This is used to thin the paint on your brush in the cleaning process. Do not use wet oils to paint with as they will not dry and will only ruin your work. Only use these to clean your brushes with. There is a range of solvents on the market that can be used to thin oil paint and or aid in cleaning up. They range in toxicity with turpentine being considered more toxic than odorless mineral spirits. The solvent essentially breaks the molecular bonds of the oils and disperses them. This thins the oils and makes them easier to clean off of brushes. 
While artist-grade solvents are more refined and contain less impurities than industrial products, they should still be treated with caution. Solvents and mediums should only be used in areas with adequate ventilation and with proper personal protection like gloves, an apron, and even goggles. Use an artist-grade odorless mineral spirit over any other solvent. Artist-grade solvents are commonly filtered more and contain less impurities. Solvents should be used sparingly and the container should be closed when not in use. Keep in mind that all oil paint solvents present some health hazards. It is important to become familiar with the safety data sheets for these products. Mediums such as alkyds or other secatives can be added to reduce the drying time. Oil painting mediums often contain toxic chemicals like petroleum distillates. There are some particularly nasty ones like cobalt dryers. This is a secative that aids in the drying process for oils, making them dry faster. Alkyd mediums are commonly used for glazing to reduce drying times and to alter the surface quality to gloss or matte. However, these mediums are toxic and should be avoided unless precautions are taken. Adequate ventilation and personal protective equipment need to be used to mitigate any risk of harm. During the 18th century, many ancient water-based mediums gained prominence in Europe, such as inks, gouache, and casein, which is made using milk protein. Perhaps the most significant development was modern watercolors, which used gum arabic and even honey to make a dried cake that could travel and, when needed, be re-wetted. This resurgence was the result of a confluence of factors. William Reeves and his brother Thomas began manufacturing watercolor cakes in the late 18th century. Employing new production methods and an innovation in the recipe, the pair were able to supply an increase of demand by citizens who had more time on their hands due to the technological advances of the modern age and effectively capitalized on emerging markets. Some consider the next several decades to be the golden age of watercolor. More recently, with the invention of acrylic resin, paint producers seized an opportunity to develop a new medium that combined the quick drying qualities of watercolor and the voluminous body of oils. They suspended it in a water soluble formula and acrylic paints were born. This new medium paved the way for a new development in art making. Several artists from the schools of abstraction, op art, abstract expressionism and pop art, as well as illustration, took advantage of the thick body the rich, wide range of colors and ease of use to make some of the most notable works of art of the mid to late 20th century. Artists such as Andy Warhol, Bridget Riley, Mark Rothko, and David Hockney created stunning works with this medium. Acrylic paints, by and large, do not present any notable health risks, and since they clean up easily with water, toxic chemicals can be avoided with ease. Most all acrylic paints will contain some amount of ammonia and propylene glycol. These are not present at levels that would make the average person ill, according to the information divulged in the SDS. The water, ammonia, and propylene glycol will evaporate into the air as part of the drying process. In large amounts, propylene glycol can present a low degree of toxicity for aquatic life. Additionally, in many of the acrylic mediums that you can add to change the character of the paint, formaldehyde is used as a preservative. In some cases, this can cause skin irritation or respiratory irritation. What is consistent here is what makes up the color, the pigment. Some pigments are a concern like cobalt compounds and cadmium compounds. This is the case regardless of the type of paint. Be mindful of this if you are handling these pigments in their raw form or if they are going to be atomized or sprayed. Always wear a mask, eye protection, and gloves as a precaution in these instances. What makes up the vehicle and binder that carry the pigment can vary greatly. This affects how it is handled and how its particular materiality informs and contributes the object overall. Watercolor, gouache, and ink are very fluid and dry quickly. Oils and acrylics have a buttery consistency spread easily and can be modeled using various tools and techniques and by adding mediums to alter their behavior. 
There is a unique tool that has emerged over the last several decades and given rise to a whole new genre of expression. The aerosol can. Spray paint, spray fixative, spray glues, and other aerosols are formulated with a number of toxic chemicals to propel the paint or other and to keep the medium wet while being sprayed. Spray paints must always be used with proper ventilation or in an open air setting. That means not just outside, but outside where there is a good circulation of air. One should always wear a respirator when using spray paint. Gloves and eye protection are also important. As a side note, earlier chemical formulas for paints could contain a range of chemicals and pigments that were dangerous. Somewhat notorious for this, copper arsenic was used to create the infamous Shields Green. Some even suspect that it was the green wallpaper in the building where Napoleon was exiled at St. Helena's that killed him. Thank you for joining me. As a final note, if you feel discomfort at any time when using chemicals, remove yourself from the area and get fresh air. If the problem persists, please seek help and consult a physician. If you want to know more about the technical world of art, like and subscribe.